What's happened when you've reported your research to the academic community? What's happened? <laughs> well, it's interesting. I've actually gotten a lot of um, feedback from various academics who have been read my paper and really loved it and wanted to follow up and discuss. And I've met a lot of great people that way. It's actually been very rewarding to expand my circle of friends among all these people who reach out to me, having read one of my papers and have interest in the same topic and have ideas. So there's a real thri- there's a thriving community of researchers who are asking deep questions about how biology works and how metabolism works and how we're being poisoned. And it's been a wonderful experience. But of course, the mainstream <laughs> machinery is basically uh, worried about me, I think. And they're trying everything to do everything they can to make sure people don't hear my message. I think they're, they feel threatened. I think they are aware that I am onto something big here and that uh, they should be worried because, you know, what they're practicing and what they're t- teaching us is wrong. And uh, they don't want the population to know that. So they want to make sure that I'm not heard. Can you tell us more about the impact that genetically modified foods have on our health? Yeah, well, that's a really interesting question. In fact, you know, there was such a long time that there were a lot of anti-GMO activists who were uh, worried about the GMO technology and how that might impact the plant. And it was frustrating to me that it took a long time for those folks to realize that one of the big problems with the GMOs is that they enable the toxic chemicals. And so they were sort of misguided, I think, in being worried about the GMO itself rather than the consequence of the GMO in terms of your exposure to the chemicals that the GMO enables. And that's particularly true for the glyphosate. The glyphosate GMO Roundup Ready gene is, is, is really the biggest GMO on the market. The, the, most, the biggest number of crops that have the GMO are crops that are resistant to glyphosate because of inserting a bacterial gene into the plant genome. And, um, and so, uh, in fact, when they studied the GMO crops to, to get approval, I was shocked to find out that they didn't actually expose them to glyphosate. The, the, the GMO crops that were studied to see if they were you know, substantially equivalent to the non-GMO didn't expose them to glyphosate. And it's the glyphosate that's what makes the crop bad. So it's kind of amazing to me that they don't, um, that they didn't catch on to that. I think it, it, Jeffrey Smith's a good example because it was when he met me, actually, he, he invited me to a, he, he, he visited and we did a, an interview and it actually got a lot of coverage on the web. That was one, one of my first interviews when I was first finding out about glyphosate. And I think it changed his mind because he's been a lot more focused on, on glyphosate uh, since then which I really welcome. And I think other anti-GMO activists are, are realizing that. Whether the GMO itself is also a problem is something I've been agnostic on. And it's just because I haven't really done a deep dive into that field, I really can't say. Um, it, it could be doing all kinds of nasty things. I just uh, don't know. What is the business of agriculture, crop insurance and crop subsidies? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's just really, really sad that this country, the United States government, invests in agriculture and it protects, you know, uh, farmers from disaster. But it mostly invests in the giant mega farms that are monocrop, you know, monocrop mega farms using lots of toxic chemicals. Uh, So it really is very, very frustrating to me that the government can't seem to recognize that that's the wrong way to go. I would love it if they would take back all that money and instead invest it into the small farmers, because what we need to do is to return to the large to the large number of small family farms. That's what we're losing. We're losing that. And it's a very valuable thing that we're losing. And um, it's going to be very hard to get it back, of course, because all the small farmers are have been basically retired or dead or kicked out of the out of the field because they can't compete with the large farms. So we're in the wrong, we're going in the wrong direction with the way the subsidies are being spent. And so, um, which then encourages people, of course, to choose to to grow agriculture in the way that they're gonna be buffered by the government if there's a disaster. So we we just need to reverse that. And, And I'm hoping at some point the government will recognize that fact and do it. What impact do electromagnetic fields from cell phones and Wi-Fi have on our health? Well, that's a big one. And then there are a lot of people that are devoting attention to that. And again, that's one that I have not yet gotten too deep into because of all my other interests. But I do believe that they are working synergistically with glyphosate. And I'm aware of some papers that have shown that EMFs can actually uh, cause calcium uptake by the cells, which can be uh, toxic to the cells. And I know glyphosate also causes calcium uptake. So you've got synergistic toxicity between the EMFs and the glyphosate, which is gonna be um, a double whammy. So I think that 
I think it's a, um, an important field and we definitely need more research. And it, it's still, um, it's one of those things like all the other things in our environment that the industry tries very hard to say, no, there's no trouble, there's no problem, this is fine. And then you have other naysayers who are saying, no, wait a minute, look at this, look at that. And the population, the general population doesn't know who to believe. You know, it's the same thing with all of these chemicals. Please discuss the following agencies as they relate to food and agriculture regulation. The Department of Agriculture, the USDA, the EPA, the FDA, the CDC, the Patent and Trademark Office, and the FTC. <laughs> That's quite a list. I don't know much about the Patent and Trademark o Office and how they relate to it. I'm sure patents you know, are, are important, I guess, to get the patents to work. All the other ones sort of have all kinds of overlap in, their, in what they do. And sometimes they pass the buck, too, because, I mean, the FDA is concerned with food, making sure food is safe. And the EPA is concer concerned with the environment. And so, of course, the environment and the food are, are overlapping with respect to something like glyphosate. So they can point the finger at the other one and say, no, it's your problem. No, it's yours. And nobody does anything. Um, and then the uh, CDC, you know, they're really big on vaccines. They're, they're, they're supposed to be sort of immune disease, you know, trying to protect from in infectious diseases. And uh, their main game is just make sure everybody gets vaccinated, which is, I think, misguided. I think they should be teaching people to have healthy lifestyle so they have a strong immune system so that the infectious disease won't touch them. So, um, yeah, good enough, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Has there been an increase in food allergies and do you have any idea why? <laughs> do I have any idea why? I definitely do. Another topic in my book, I talk a lot about that. It's quite fascinating. Uh, and of course, celiac disease is the obvious one. And of course, so many kids are having issues with their gut, you know, gut dysbiosis, leaky gut, you know, chronic, you know, bloating and pain, and diarrhea, and constipation, all these different gut issues, which is a reflection of glyphosate disrupting the gut back microbiome. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that the difficulty with digesting fats, I believe there's also a uh, difficulty with digesting proteins. And that's again, shown by Anthony Samsel. He and I published a paper together where um, he measured, he, he found high levels of glyphosate in, uh, in enzymes that break down proteins into individual amino, amino acids and in lipase, which is the one that metabolizes fats. All three, of, there were two of these amino uh, protein metabolizing enzymes and then the lipase, all of them were contaminated with glyphosate. I think they're being broken by the glyphosate so that it disrupts the ability to break down protein. So when you eat wheat, wheat is a difficult protein to break down. It has a lot of proline uh, molecules in it. And um, proline, we actually get assistance from our gut microbes to break down proline because it's a difficult um, amino acid to separate from, the, from its neighbors. And the uh, gut microbes have developed specialized enzymes that can break that apart. And in particular, lactobacillus, which is hit very hard by glyphosate, is able to, to help us digest wheat. And so when lactobacillus is getting killed off by glyphosate, then we become impaired in our ability to digest the wheat. So we get these wheat proteins, the gluten segments that are uh, allergenic. And we, it also induces a leaky gut barrier. So those undigested proteins get into the general circulation. And that's when the immune cells get upset and they start developing antibodies to those proteins. And then those antibodies become autoantibodies attacking our own tissues through a mechanism called molecular mimicry. It's a well-known phenomenon. And I think that we have an epidemic. We do have an epidemic in many different autoimmune diseases. Again, that's a chapter in my book uh, that's coming out in June. And um, that uh, I think they're all uh, likely the epidemic is caused by glyphosate's ability to disrupt um, the metabolism of those proteins. 